You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 93 of the Common Descent Podcast. Woo! It's August. It is August. Of 2020, and this month we have a theme for our episodes. Yeah, we don't do this really, so this is new. This is going to be a pair of episodes about cats and dogs. Cats and dogs. This is the first one we are going to be talking about cats. Felids. The family Felidae, including everything from the big cats down to the small cats, uh, yeah, house they're, cats. They're all little, cats. <laughs> little things. All cats. We're going to talk about what cats are like, where cats came from, what the fossil record of cats is, what we have now, what we had, had used to have in the past. And to kind of tie this into the next one, well, there'll just be little bits of sort of comparison. Yeah. With their, their cousins on the other side of the mammal carnivore tree. Yeah. Because... Comparing cats to dogs is one of my favorite ways to discuss cats and dogs. Well, it's they're both super popular pets, like the pets. Yep. But also both really successful predators that are both carnivorans. And very interesting to compare and contrast. Yeah, they so, are good foils to one another. So we'll be doing a little bit of that with their, their wild and extinct relatives. This episode topic was requested in one form or another... By John, our patron. Thanks, also, John. Also, thanks, John. Teodora, Lizzie, Jonathan, Damien, Alejo, and somebody on the survey. Oh, yeah. I won't put an anonymous requester on the survey. Thank you, mystery requester. And to everybody else. So we'll be getting into that topic in a little bit. But first, a few announcements. Just a couple this time. Number one, we have a Patreon. Mm-hmm. If you become a patron on our Patreon, you get all sorts of goodies. One of the goodies is we'll say your name on the podcast when you join us at a certain level. This episode, we would like to welcome LR, Kevin, Eric, Arturo, and Carly. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Hey, we have a Patreon. Our Patreon helps to support the podcast. It basically helps us do everything we do for the podcast nowadays. Yes, it is our financial support, and it is supporting us fully and letting us do cool stuff that we were not able to do. In fact, we've got some cool stuff kind of, sort of, in the works. We're not going to announce it. We're not going to announce it right now, but stay tuned. <laughs> Speaking of ways you can support us, we also have a Zazzle store. Link in the description to the episode where you can buy merchandise, mm -hmm. which helps us a little bit, but mostly it's about getting, allowing you to sort of have a piece of the podcast with you if you want to have a shirt or a mug or something. You can also share us on social media and like, review us on iTunes. Yes, which please. Which is very nice because iTunes likes to see stars and stuff. One last thing, this is episode 93, and that means that we are rapidly coming up on episode 100. Yeah. As we've discussed the last few episodes, we want to do something special. We have some ideas. We have received some really cool ideas for our from our, pat uh, our listeners in general and our patrons as well. We will not be able to do all of them. Al already, we have a lot of ideas that are great ideas that we aren't going to end up doing yes. for episode 100. There are more opportunities in the future. <laughs> there are more hundreds than one. <laughs> That's right. Come back in four more years. Maybe we'll do your idea. But seriously, if you have a fun idea for episode 100, we're still taking suggestions. Let us know. And with that, I think it is time to move on to the news. News! Every episode before we record, Will and I gather up some of the news from the world of paleontology, evolution, earth history, the kind of things we like, the kind of things we assume you like since you're listening to the podcast. Helps to keep us up to date, keeps you up to date. Will, what news do you have this time? Some potentially revealing information about the history of where crocs in the Americas came from. Oh, interesting. Today's crocs. Yeah, our crocs here in the North America, South America, Central America. Mm -hmm. a, a good place to be a croc. A very good place to be a croc. In fact, the best place. This is research by Massimo Delfino et al. in Scientific Reports. And the press release is in fizz.org, which we'll be linking to. So crocodiles in the Americas uh, are actually fairly diverse for such a, a small bit of the world. Uh, caimans and the alligator are also here, so it's one of the most crocodilian diverse areas, but crocodiles specifically is what this research is about. 
The crocodiles found here today include the American crocodile, uh, Morlitz crocodile, the Cuban crocodile, and the Orinoco crocodile. And there's been some debate as to how did crocs get to the Americas historically. And this research on a fossil specimen from Africa seems to support that they swam over from Africa. Okay. As opposed to, like, going across continental connections mm -hmm. to the north or, or, or maybe to the south. Yeah, that they came across some seaway from Africa. Okay. Seems like a croc sort of thing to do. They are in Africa as well. And this fossil is Crocodilus chechii and appears to be closely related to the American crocodile. Okay, but from Africa. But from Africa. Hmm. They CT scanned the skull to try to identify more detailed features. And the feature that stood out that really put the nail in its relation was a protrusion, a bump on the snout, which is not found in any other American crocodile except the American crocodile. <laughs> except the species called the American crocodile. <laughs> yes, the Crocodilus acutus. The American crocodile, if you, anyone has ever seen one, you know the bump I'm talking about. <laughs> they have this weird bulge right in front of the eyes. And this crocodile also had this fossil crocodile, Chechii, also has that protuberance. And so that's a unique thing and suggests a close relationship or a closer relationship between those two, which supports the idea that they came over from Africa. Now, as for the timing... The remains of Chechii of this specimen dated 7 million years ago. And the oldest remains of a crocodile in America, which is Crocodilus falconensis, have been dated to 5 million years. So it predates the earliest crocs we know of in the Americas. So once again, supporting that they came this way. And the researchers estimate that this means crocs could have made that migration as early as 11 to 5 million years ago. So late Miocene. Yeah. So just in time to join the alligators that we find at the Gray Fossil site. Yeah, exactly. So they're building that support for how crocs moved around the world. Very cool. It, it, you know, I think that this is something that when we talk about paleontology, we talk about identifying species and we talk about the evolution of species. But something, and we, we talk about this on the podcast all the time, is dispersal of species. Yeah. How different groups get to different places. It's easy to get it in your head that, you know, T-Rex lived in North America, but from a paleontological evolutionary perspective, it had to get there somehow. Yes. Like, where did it come from? What are, where are its relatives? Did yeah. it evolve here or did it come over? It has cousins in Asia. Did it start out there? And that's always a question that's foremost on the minds of paleontologists. And you learn a lot. This is how Darwin used biogeography mm -hmm. to support his big theory back in the day is by looking at you live here, but where are your closest relatives? Yes. And, and that's one of the cool things about tracking the dispersal of a group or a species is as you track it backwards, you're not only going, you know, farther back in time in their movements, but also in their ancestry. So yep. you can, eventually you will get to where it originated, which is important, you know, did you evolve your features, you know, that your ancestral features here where you are now or somewhere else for some other reason? Uh, and that's that's cool. Always good information to have. Well, speaking of new species, my first bit of news is a bit older. This is a new species from the Eocene of an early owl. I like owls. Owls are cool birds. As birds go, not too bad. This is research by Gerald Mayer et al. in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and we will link to a press piece in Psy News. Owls are birds, birds of prey. They're Correct. the ones with the, the big eyes and the sharp feet and the, the quiet wings. Very inquisitive. <laughs> Not as smart as everything makes them out to be from all my friends who have worked with owls. Well, they don't know who anybody is. They're always <laughs> asking. The oldest owls in the... This is... Listen, dad jokes. The, the oldest owls in the fossil <laughs> record are... From the Paleocene, so going back to around 60 million years ago, which is old. I did not realize that owls went back almost to the Mesozoic. Yeah, that's... It, <laughs> they they have been around for a while. 
A bunch of different types of owls are known from the Eocene, so after 55 million years. And in this study, they are naming a new species from that time period. This is the early Eocene, so 55 to 50 million years ago or so, from Wyoming. The specimen was discovered 30 years ago and is finally getting a description and naming now in this paper. The fossil itself consists of most of the postcrania, which is the paleontology word for things past the skull. So, the body. Yeah. Most of the body. The new genus and species are named Primoptinx polyotoros, identified as a relative of a group called Protostrigidae, or basically proto-owls. Yeah. It's somewhere in that, not quite an owl, maybe one of these proto-owls, but somewhere in the early evolution of owls. It's described as being about 60 centimeters tall, about 23 inches, so about two feet. Mm -hmm. Similar in size to snowy owls. But what's really interesting uh, that the authors describe is its talons. Modern owls, the, so the talons are the claws on their feet, which yep, they're yep, using yep. to capture prey. In modern owls, the talons are similarly sized on all the toes. Yes. But this owl, the back toe, so the hallux, the, the toe that points backwards, and their next toe, pointing forward, are particularly large talons. Interesting. Which is a pattern we see in proto-owls, mm -hmm. earlier owls than this, and also in modern-day hawks. Yes. And birds like hawks. Yeah, that that enlarged inner toe claw is not something that only Velociraptor and Deinonychus yes. had. <laughs> Modern birds of prey, hawks and stuff, have prominent inner toe claws. Yep. And as the paper describes... Part of the reason they have that is because hawks and and the like use those claws to kill their prey. Mm -hmm. Owls use their talons to capture their prey, but they're typically killing their prey with their beaks. Well, and, and also with their foot. Uh, owls have very strong grips and a lot of times kill their prey by just crushing it. Crunch. Because they are going to swallow it whole, so they need to soften it up. <laughs> like, And that's why you don't let an owl sit on your arm without protection. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen pictures. So it could be, they suggest, that this ancient species of owl, this ancient genus, Primoptinx, and proto-owls similar to it may have been hunting more like hawks hunt rather than hunting and eating the way that owls do. And it could be, if they have these bigger claws for more rapid dispatching, that maybe they were preying on prey that was either larger or mm -hmm. more defensive. Yep, yep, yep. Prey that's harder to kill. Yeah, because uh, if you think of a hawk taking down a rabbit and then, like, pulling strips of meat off, that's normal for them. But owls eat things they can swallow. Yeah, small little, things. little mice and things like that. So if you're taking on bigger prey, you might have to adopt. Or maybe those things are, like, ancestral and stuff. Yeah, it could be. This also suggests a diversity of not only size, since this is a different size than a lot of the owls from the time, but ecology. Mm -hmm. If it's hunting differently, that means there was this time period where you had a bunch of owls doing a bunch of different things. And they further suggest that it is in the late Eocene that we see the arrival of hawks and their cousins. And perhaps, maybe that's why we don't have owls that hunt that way anymore, mm -hmm. is that hawks came in and owls were ended up restricted to a more owl-like way of hunting and feeding. Yeah, that those with the bigger... Claws, the the differentiated claws got out competed by our hawks and eagles. So the owls we have now are stealthy and, and quiet and, and eat smaller things. Eat small things with, and they also have those cool weird feet. Owls are very cool. Hey, if you want an owls episode, let us know. Oh yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> well, then speaking of birds, my next news is about a to. Take part of the, the title for the article, Giant Fruit Gulping Pigeon. <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> this is research by David Stedman and Una Takano in Zootaxa, and the articles by Natalie Van Hoos in Florida Museum News. So this is a giant pigeon from Oceania, more specifically Fiji. An extinct giant pigeon, and there's the study was looking at both the causes of its distinction, but also uh, the the diversity of birds on this island and these islands. 
Okay, so this is a one of those giant island birds. Yes, that, which that we've mentioned so many so many times on this podcast. The the news article, as you'll notice when we link it, and if you were to look at this up, research up on your own, many of them are comparing it to the dodo. Okay, yes, I did see that. Yeah, a lot of them comparing it to the dodo, but as it points out, unlike the dodo, this one seems to have been flighted. Okay, interesting. This is Tongo ns burleii and is a new genus and species. Very cool. It was a large pigeon, uh, but decently large. About the size of a large duck is how it was described. Okay. I was wondering how large a giant pigeon is. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Which comes out to about 20 inches long, which is about 50 centimeters, and that's not including the tail. Okay. So add a plume onto the end of that. (laughs) Beak beak to behind. (laughs) Yes. And would have weighed at least five times as much as your average, like, city pigeon today. So it's a pigeon with the strength of five pigeons. It's when these pigeons combine. Yeah. <laughs> this large pigeon seemed like it was spending time in the canopy and is was likely a fruit gulper, swallowing fruit whole. Ooh, weird. Now, the islands it was found on are known for columbids, or the pigeon group. It includes pigeons and doves. And this bird would have been living there about 60,000 years ago, and then vanished a century or two after humans arrived, just about 3,000 years ago. That follows the pattern of humans going to islands? Yep. And as Stedman was quoted saying, pigeons and doves just taste good. (laughs) (laughs) That it was probably very much a dodo situation of, this is a, a big bird that Tasted good. And and didn't know to run away from people. Yeah, and that's this was very likely uh, a situation of island gigantism. Due to potentially various situations, uh, these islands are devoid of many of the typical predators for pigeons. Uh, There's, you know, no primates or carnivores, uh, or naturally none. I'm sure many of them have it now since we've arrived. Yep. The, The subject of this episode. Hawks and owls are absent on many of the islands, which are also predators and so this group of birds the pigeons and doves have done well in these islands for the better part of 30 or 40 million years and so they're very diverse there today there's more than 90 species in oceana the global epicenter of pigeon and dove diversity is what the article called it which is cool to know right that's a nice title to have but today it is much diminished the islands it was found on specifically are the tongan islands Today, there are only about four species of pigeon and dove, which is about half of what historically was there. Mm. And they note that the absence of this diversity, especially of Tonguinas, very likely will have an effect on the ecology, considering that many of the pigeons, the pigeons that are there now, are too small to eat many of the fruits that Tonguinas was likely gulping. Yeah. So, so they're not dispersing those seeds. Yeah, so those are not getting dispersed the way they very likely were. Uh, so it's too soon to know exactly what changes that's going to have. Now there's another side to this study that it, it, this is one of those weird studies where it's a study on bird morphology for the most part. Right. That also designated and dis- described a new genus and species. Oh, okay. So uh, it's so also with it buried within here. Yes, there's a new species. And so the the title is both of those. And yeah, it's <laughs> studies can do more than one thing at during a publication. Sure can. The study on the morphology was looking at the proportions of leg length to, to where those birds spent most of their time in the forest structure, elevation-wise. Okay. so Ground so dwelling, is... flitting in between the ground and the branches, and canopy dwelling. So this is what we would call ecomorphology. Yes. How your morphology, your anatomy, relates to your ecology, where you fit in the ecosystem. And so they found a very strong trend between those three sections, with tree dwellers having shorter legs more suitable for perching and gripping during high winds. Makes sense. Ground dwellers had longer legs for walking and running. Right, greater stride. Yep. The long, longer steps. And then those that lived in between had legs that were in between. That tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and not only did they find 
strong correlation with leg length, they also found that in those groups, there was also a strong agreement for the grouping and related groups, related species. The molecular data matched up. So it seems that the ones living in different areas are also more closely related, typically. Oh, interesting. Oh, that, that's interesting to, to note. And this research is also what let them say that Tonganass was a canopy dweller. So it fell in the group and also seemed to match the, the measurements for a canopy dweller, which led them to hypothesize that it was likely brightly colored and potentially with lots of plumage, you know, gaudy plumage, like the other pigeons that you see in the treetops in this area, and would have had more likely had brighter color, you know, more intense colors, which actually act as better camouflage in the treetops than the browns that you see as camouflage down on the ground. Makes sense. So a big, potentially showy pigeon that's, on these islands, gulping fruit. Cool to know. You know, it's funny. You talked about the whole the whole thing, new species, uh, pigeon extinctions, the effect on the ecology. But the one thing that you said that made me like, wait, I have a scientific question. <laughs> you said that shorter legs are good for perching and staying stable during high winds. I wonder if birds on islands, on yeah. tropical islands, have different perching adaptations versus birds on continental interiors. Absolutely. Like we talked several episodes ago about the lizards. Yep, yep, yep. In the Caribbean that had uh, a adapted to the threat of hurricanes because you have winds. Well, if you're tropical islands, they don't, they don't technically have hurricanes over there because they don't mm -mm. call them that. <laughs> I think they're typhoons. Yes. <laughs> But huh, I I wonder, I wonder if anyone's ever done that study. It sure would make sense. I would do it, but I won't. No, no. Well, since you started off this news a section of this episode with a bit of research from scientific reports about crocodiles, I will end this news section with a bit of research from scientific reports about snakes. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Because I was like, there were not two, I would have done two. <laughs> this is research on a modern snake, not fossil that uncovers a unique feeding behavior in certain snakes in Asia. This is research by Yosuke Kojima et al. in Scientific Reports. There is not a press release or a, like news article about this. We'll link to the paper in Scientific Reports. Uh, it'll be a technical link, but yeah, no one has written about this. If they do, we'll, we'll put it in there. Yeah. Snakes, uh, in addition to being the best animals, have highly mobile jaws. We talked about this back in episode three. Snake jaws move independently. The left and right side, especially on the bottom, the, the mandibles, the lower jaw, can move separately from each other. For many snakes, or at least in, in most snakes today, for many snakes, they use this movement to help them walk their jaws over their prey as they eat it. They'll, they'll step with one jaw and then the next to sort of gradually pull themselves over the prey. There are two families of snail-eating snakes, the Pareidae in Southeast Asia and the Dipsadinae, mainly in South America, which have independently evolved the habits of eating slugs and snails mm -hmm. and having, even for a snake, particularly mobile jaws. Like, even more movable jaws than most snakes. <laughs> And these are generally good for what they will do is slip their lower jaw into the shell opening and pull the snail out. <laughs> they will hook it with their teeth and pull it out with their jaws. They use their one part of their jaw like an eye eyes finger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, here is a tricky uh, uh, obstacle for snakes. The reason they want to pull the snails out of the shell is because they don't want to eat the shell. That's, it's hard to get down. It's actually harmful yeah. if you tried to eat that. Because as mobile as their jaws are, they are wimpy and could not handle tough shells. Well, they're made of soft things on the inside. <laughs> Some snails have a feature called an operculum, mm -hmm. which is basically like a, uh, uh, it's kind of like a horseshoe. Well, it's, a, it's a little hatch. <laughs> it's a little hatch. It is attached to the snail's body, and it's this little hard uh, 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 manhole cover that closes over the entrance of the shell when they go inside to protect them. 
These can be problematic for snakes because even if they pull the snail out, they're getting the operculum with it, and Mm -hmm. that's a hard thing that can cut up their insides or cause damage to them. So it's been shown that certain snail-eating snakes will just avoid snails that have an operculum. Mm -hmm. In this research, the researchers uh, studied a a certain species of snail-eating snake that doesn't avoid the operculum to see what they were doing. This was a study that was conducted. They collected a bunch of snakes and snails from Gunung Mulu National Park in Malaysia. These are Piraeid snakes. They collected eight blunt-headed snail-eating snakes. This is the species Aplopeltera boa. And then they uh, also collected 30 Leptopoma snails, which are snails that have opercula. One by one, they introduced the snails to the snakes and watched what the snakes do. And here's the behavior they observed in the snakes, a behavior that has never been seen before. They would catch the snail, and then they would use their mandibles to go in and work around the operculum and pull the snail out. Then, once they had pulled the snail out, they would spit it, soft body, back out, reposition their head, and and grab it back in the mouth, and position the snail in the mouth so that one side of their jaw, usually the left side, was holding the body of the snail in place, and the other side, usually the right side, the lower jaw was positioned at the border where the operculum attached to the soft body of the snail. One side holding the snail, the other side positioned at the operculum attachment, and then the snake would slide the lower jaw against that attachment point, Forward and backwards, forward and backwards, forward and backwards, in a a, a behavior that the authors have called mandibular sawing. Yeah. They said that it took anywhere between 2 and 51 strokes, though typically, I think they said the median was 14, so typically, you know, a dozen strokes. Yeah. And eventually sawed the operculum off the snail and then ate the rest of the soft body. Wow. That's pretty incredible what a cool thing listen i know i'm the snakes guy and like everything (laughs) snakes do i'm like how cool but setting that aside how cool right what a cool thing to do that's (laughs) that's cool for a a number of reasons and the two that jump out at me to me is that you're you're doing a mechanical you know tool like job with your mouth yep it's like a woodpecker you know jackhammering a tree yeah this, these snakes have a saw in their mouth that you have created you have used your jaw as an industrial tool but also and i i know that it is not this but it it if you were to just show me that without any context and i i were not informed about it sure does look like problem solving right which is cool it's instinctual almost surely right <laughs> but it it is such a cool solution to a weird problem yeah. you know a an evolutionarily clever solution that it's it's impressive it is the authors note this is not the only case of what they called prey breaking behavior <laughs> <laughs> in snakes uh because sna- there are snakes that are known to hunt crabs and yes. termites that are known to pull them apart yeah i had, he- I had heard about the crab eating yeah. snakes that do that there are crab eating snakes in asia that will grab the crab in their mouth and then wrap their body around like a leg and pull. And then I know there are snakes that will like scrape the heads off of termites so that they are not eating the part with all the toxins Mm -hmm. or something to that effect. But it is the first known example of a snake using just its jaws to break a a prey and possibly the first mandibular sawing ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. And it's possible that it's only able to do that because of how mobile the jaws of snail-eating snakes are. Yeah. And then a little note that they made, which I wouldn't even have thought of, and I'm so glad they made it because it is a paleontologically significant note. The snake's teeth are not adapted for slicing. I I was wondering. They have the typical comb-like or needle-like teeth that are good for holding. They are not slicing teeth, which means they are using their teeth in a way that the teeth are not ideally adapted for, which is a paleontologist makes you go, 
cool, if we found this in the fossil record, would we know that they were doing this? Yes. Because it doesn't seem like we would know it from the teeth. Mm-hmm. Although, it also makes me wonder, is there, like, are there wear patterns on the teeth? Like, what if, <laughs> what kind of wear pattern do you get by sawing snails? Yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating... Snakes do so many cool things with their jaws. Like It's just, there is the, an endless list of awesome things that snakes do to make up for not having arms. Right. And it's so cool. <laughs> to to uh, uh, balance out the a risky choice they made. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wonder, because you mentioned that they typically align the snail on the same right-left side. 80% of the time, yeah. they were cutting with the right. So... It makes me wonder... 80% of 30 trials. So, to the degree that that's significant. 80% of every time they tested. Yes. Uh, I wonder if we were to fast forward a a couple million years into the future, would we see descendants of these snakes that have a asymmetrical jaw? Yeah. With... One side is a saw blade. One side's a saw blade. Because they still need the hook teeth to get them out of the shell. And to hold it. And to hold... Like, you still need those snake-like hooks but if you're hooking with one side and sawing with the other right. then would we start to see specialization to the two sides would they see that would they evolve teeth like those baboon teeth yes like those shearing yes where you have like a varanid <laughs> you know a komodo you jaw zipidont teeth yeah yeah cool stuff hey will i you and i we get at each other's throats <laughs> because you have a favorite group of impressive carnivorous reptiles and i have a favorite group of impressive carnivorous reptiles but you know what we can both agree on what there is a particularly cool group of impressive carnivorous mammals there is the cats and with that clever segue after this break we'll talk about cats i've always been more of a dog person Right off the bat, doing a whole discussion about cats is a little bit weird compared to our other episodes, because typically when we do this group of animals, we start by talking about their description and, and you know, what they're like and what yeah. features they have. And a lot of the time it's like, oh, turtles or sharks, and you know, here's some stuff you might not know. Cats must be one of the absolute most familiar groups of animals to human beings. They're outside of humans ourselves. I can only think of one other type of animal that is probably more familiar Mm -hmm. to humans as a whole. And that's next episode. Yes. Like if you've seen a cat, if you've held a cat, if you've been near a cat, like house cat, think of a house cat. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's that of varying sizes. It kind of has the feeling of being like, all right, everyone. So let's go over exactly what a chair is. Right. Have you heard of them? Like it's, you know, (laughs) it is, it is odd and notable for how well we know these animals unprofessionally, like just individually. As humans. Yes. It is part of the human experience that most of us are pretty familiar with cats. To be brief about it, cats, as we are discussing them here, we're talking about the family Felidae. So this is lions, leopards, house cats. These are big to small quadrupedal predators that live across much of the world. They are mammals. So furry, produce milk, all the mammal stuff. They belong to a group called carnivorans, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about more in a bit, but generally is includes most of the major mam- mammalian carnivores that are around today. Cats today are a fairly widespread and diverse group. There are 38 recognized living species of cats. Which is less than I would have expected if you asked me to guess. Yeah, it's much more like crocs yeah. than like when we talk about frogs or, or snakes, yes. where the numbers are in the thousands. No, there's 38 species of cats. They are found on Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Cats are not native. <laughs> in Australia... And they are not in Antarctica. I I highly doubt there is a cat in Antarctica. I wonder if there was, like, a cat that was on one expedition. I'm sure there has been a cat in Antarctica. Yeah, like, (laughs) it was the ship cat that took care of rats. Just one miserable cat in Antarctica. Mr. Tibbs technically (laughs) made it to Antarctica. 
They live in lots of habitats around the world. Typically, we think of cats living in grasslands or in forests, but there are exceptions. And let's take a little trip through the diversity of cats, uh, which will allow us not only to look at how cats what the major groups of cats are, but also I'll, I'll point out some of the unusual examples along the way. Recent research, especially genetic research, has grouped cats into eight main related lineages or groups. Uh, this is fairly recent. I've seen a couple papers reference this, and we'll go with it here because it's convenient. Number one, the domestic cat lineage, or wild cat lineage, includes jungle cats, sand cats, wild cats. And wild cats are the ones from which our domestic cats were domesticated. Mm -hmm. This is a group of mostly small cats, house cat sized, that are in the old world, Asia, Africa, Europe. Uh, they include the sand cats, which is a rare example of cats that live in deserts. These are cats that live in sandy and stony deserts of Asia and Africa. They're typically sandy colored mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. camouflage. We have the leopard cat lineage, which is not leopards but leopard cats, <laughs> which are a much smaller group of cats that are not closely related to leopards. Bad name. <laughs> <laughs> this group also includes the fishing cats, which are cats that are specialized for eating fish. They, yeah. they even have like slightly longer snouts. All right, that's cool. Yeah, like crocodiles. <laughs> uh, it also includes a, a number of small cats in Asia. Uh, it also includes the rusty spotted cats, which you will typically see on the list of the smallest cat. Right. I knew I had heard that name. Rusty spotted cats typically weigh about a kilogram. Cool. So two pounds. Very small little cats. There's the puma lineage, which includes the genus puma. So cougars, mountain lions, Florida panther. That's all the same. It's all the same thing. Yep. It also includes jaguarundis, which are a smaller cat that is mostly southern Americas. These two are in the Americas. And this lineage also includes cheetahs Weird. over in Africa. Yep. <laughs> this group has some fairly large cats. Pumas and cheetahs are both the size of me and Will. Yeah. Like human size, or if you prefer, wolf size. Yeah. These are fairly large cats compared to most of the others. The, the, now we are in scary predator territory. Yes, that's, that's something that actually is worrisome. There's the lynx lineage, which includes bobcats and lynxes across North America and Eurasia. The best ears. There's the ocelot lineage, which are cats of Central and South America that include ocelots and margays. Also includes, one of note, the Andean mountain cat. Oh. Which is a rare example of a cat that is adapted to habitats thousands of meters above sea level. High in the mountains. You've got the caracal lineage, which includes caracals, servals, African golden cats. These are all Africa and Asia. You've got the bay cat lineage, which includes marbled cats, Asian golden cats. These are all southeastern Asian species. And of note, this is something I learned. Bay cats are a species endemic to the island of Borneo. Oh. That's where they're found. Wow. Did not know there were cats that did that. There are other island cats. I did not know that there were cats that were island endemic. Whew. Now, if you've been counting, that's seven lineages. All of those are traditionally considered part of... All of those are typically considered part of the Felinae, or Felini, depending on... It's a subfamily or it's a tribe, depending on whose taxonomy you're following. These are what you might often hear considered small cats. Yeah, even though there are big members... This is the small cat group. Right. Most of them are house cat to bobcat size. Like I said, you've got some wolf-sized cats. The final lineage is the pantherine cats, the big cats. The big ones. These are cats that are mostly in the old world. Africa, Europe, Asia, leopards, lions, tigers, snow leopards, clouded leopards, sunda clouded leopards. And then over here in the new world, we have jaguars. Jaguars! I mentioned the rusty spotted cat as the smallest cat. The big cats, unsurprisingly, includes the largest cat species. Will, do you know what the largest cat species is? I know. You can do it. It's I, the one you think it is. It's Siberian tiger? Tigers. Tigers. Yeah, I, I absolutely can, tigers. That, there's one that is the... And I can always... I, I can never You remember. might be right. I, I think don't it's Siberian? One. But yeah, tigers. I have typically in papers while I was researching, I saw tigers referenced as getting up to 300 kilograms. <laughs> but elsewhere online, I've seen references to i guess maybe these are record holders at clo uh, up around 400 kilograms so we're talking 700 to 900 pounds 
which is less of the size of a cat and more of the size of a bear. Yep. That's that's bigger than most bears. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tigers are big, big animals. They are everything about them. Like it, the first time you get to see a tiger's skull or their teeth or their claws, it's all too big, I would say. Very impressive. All of these cats share the fact that they are cats and they have certain general characteristics of their anatomy. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what cat anatomy looks like. Conveniently, cats are pretty standard. There's not a ton of variation in body shape across cats. Which is actually really interesting because it means that this is a, a morphology that works at the small and large scale. Oh, yeah. Works in trees, works on mountains, yeah. works in the grasslands. It is very multi-use. Yeah, all-purpose. All-purpose. This, this is an all-terrain mammal. Yeah. Cats are quadrupedal. They walk on four legs. They are digitigrade, which means that they are standing on their toes with their ankles and wrists held above the ground when they walk. Same way dogs walk. Yeah. Typically, cat limbs are short and stocky relative to, for comparison, dogs. Yes. So if you think about wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, they tend to have long, slender legs. Mm -hmm. Cat limbs tend to be shorter and a little bit beefier. A little meatier. Which means that, but also more flexible. Yes. A cat can rotate its paws inward. The, ex the elbow is flexible enough that the cat can turn its paws in, which is useful for climbing or grabbing at things. A lot of cats, especially tree climb, like specialized tree climbers, their ankles can rotate. That's cool. To give them a little extra grip. The basic setup of cat limbs is that they are built for flexibility over speed. If you think of the way a dog's legs, wolf, coyote, etc., are a lot like a horse. It's that they are a predator version of a horse. Long and slender, which is good for speed. Mm -hmm. Cat leg. Cats are capable of of moving quickly. Yeah, I'm sure as we said that, people are like, but cheetah. We'll talk about cheetahs. <laughs> you hang yes. on. But in general, cats are ambush hunters. They're not running long distances, and their arms are a bit more flexible. They're a bit more uh, uh, maneuverable. And uh, one of my favorite ways to demonstrate that is think about the way that cats play versus the way that dogs play. Yes. A house cat plays by grabbing a thing and falling over. Yeah. It grabs it with its hands at its feet and then bites at it. A dog plants its feet and grabs the thing and shakes it around. Yep. It's all with the mouth. And it, it's the the another difference in their play of cats are pouncing at things. Dogs chase. Yes. Like that. They love to chase. They sure do. Another difference, if you're comparing cats and dogs, this is one you'll have noticed if you've ever picked up a cat and picked up a, a best it for a small dog. Yeah. Uh, cats are very flexible in their body. Yeah, made out of slinkies. Cats, their their bo their vertebrae, the, the articulations, the connections between their vertebrae and their backbone allow a lot of twisting and bending. If you ever pick up a cat, they fold. And this is really good for maneuvering. They can twist, they can turn... Uh, great for when you're climbing, great for when you're chasing prey, if you're changing direction quickly or something like that. Cheetahs, notably the one living species of cat that is actually designed for speed. Yes. And they are, they have, their legs are a little longer, they're a little more sort of dog-like in that sense. Cheetahs, I was reading about this, get a bunch of utility out of the flexibility of the spine. Yes, they do. Because if you've ever seen, there are cool videos of this. Their spine flexes up and down as they run. I, w I read a paper that said that cheetahs get 11% of their stride length at top speed from the flexing of their spine. Yeah. That helps them lengthen their, their, their step length. So they, they have sort of ways around not being built like a dog. If you think of a dog, if you've ever picked up a dog... A cat folds, a dog is like a stiff... Yeah, it's rigid. It's rigid. Well, and it's... I, I love the cheetah. Cheetah has always been one of my favorite cats because of how they discovered a new way to run fast. Because horses are stocky, rigid spines with long, rigid legs. Yep. This is a very flexible cat that uses that flexibility to curl in on itself and then expand itself out. Yep. And that's 
awesome. It's a spring. Cats also have their shoulder blade isn't as firmly attached to their torso. No, it's not. It shifts back and forth, which also is great for flexibility and in the cheetah mobility. Cat tails are off usually rather long, helpful for climbing, leaping, running, controlling your position. Like we said, cats typically are ambush hunters more than they are chasers of the kind like dogs and wolves, which will go after something over long distances. Another famous aspect of cats, at, you know, working at, at back, back down to the bottom of the limbs, cat claws are very unique. <laughs> they are, now, usually these will be referred to as retractable. Yes. Retractable claws, although you may more correctly uh, perhaps call them protractable claws. Yeah. Because the retracted position is the resting position. <laughs> they actively stick the claws out. The two last bones in the toes and fingers of a cat's hands and feet pull back. They hinge. They hinge. And in fact, the last bone, the, the, the distal phalanx, rests in a little depression in the second to last one. They kind of like slot together. It's very mechanical looking. And it sits inside this fleshy sheath so that the claws can be hidden away. You can pull them out and uh, stick them out and pull them back in when you're not using them. Keeps the claws sharp. Yes, it's not to hide them, it's to protect them. Which means, so you can, when you need them for climbing, when you need them for grabbing at prey, uh, they aren't worn down from being walked on. They're ready, they're at your beck and call. Uh, a fun little note, since you mentioned liking cheetahs, cats have paw pads mm -hmm. under the toes. Like, do you know, dogs have that too. Cheetahs have little ridges on them for traction. Uh, they have cleats. They have cleats. They also... <laughs> Are known. I, I've seen lots of things that say they don't have retractable claws, but I've heard that it's they just they do. do they they don't have the, sh the quite as much of a sheath. Yeah, that they have them. less retractable, and right. they dull them because they use them while running. But their thumb claw is the sharp one for grabbing. Moving to the front of the body, cat skulls are very special, very mm -hmm. specialized. If we're comparing dogs to cats, the first most obvious difference is that cats have very short snouts. This is actually quite helpful because it means there's less jaw to move, which means you can get a stronger bite with less muscle musculature effort. It means you have less reach compared to something like a dog. It's like the long shears versus the little clippers. Yep. And fitting with that facial morphology, cats tend to have reduced dentition. We talked in episode 88 that different mammals have varied in their number of teeth. If you open a dog's mouth, you are seeing... Basically, the ancestral placental mammals setup of teeth. Mm -hmm. Dogs tend to have 42 teeth across their whole mouth. Cats have reduced it down usually to 28 to 30. They have gotten rid of a lot of the teeth in the cheek. Not only have they reduced the number of teeth back in the, the cheek, but the ones that are left have been modified. So one of the things that carnivorans, dogs, cats, bears, etc., all have in common is a pair of teeth on either side, one on top, one on bottom, called carnasials. Carnasials. Which, in many animals, like if you look at a dog, are pointy for cutting and often flat a bit for crushing or cracking. Mm -hmm. Cat carnasials and their other cheek teeth are blade-like. Sharp along the edge. They are, we don't need a thing that's not a blade. Cats also have relatively large canine teeth. Yeah. So four uh, two canines on either side of the incisors, top and bottom, four total. The upper canines tend to be fairly large in cats compared to other animals. Even cats today, they're, they're sort of these big spiky canines. They're the fangs. And all of this sort of tooth setup ties into what cats eat. Mm -hmm. Cats are carnivorous. They are obligate carnivores. Hyper you will, carnivores. Hyper carnivores. If you think of like, like cats don't, like what a bear will, I'm going to eat plants for the winter yeah. or the summer or whatever. It's I'm going to eat plants because they're easy, but I'll eat meat whenever it comes by. Or foxes and, and other canids will mm -hmm. often supplement their diet with fruits and stuff. Cats, for the most part, are meat eaters exclusively. That's what they do. They are they are ambush predators. They're grapplers. They are built to kill things. That is why they are full of knives. Yes. Their teeth, they, they got the big pointy ones, are especially big and pointy. 
The slicey ones in the back are especially slicey. They have a bunch of hidden blades. <laughs> All cats are slinkies covered in knives. Yes. They, they are the ninja assassins of the mammal world. And the specialization makes sense because hyper carnivory is rare. And it's rare for an entire group, yeah. more or less. It's one of the things that makes snakes so weird. Mm -hmm. That pretty much all of them are just going to eat meat. Now, cats, the, 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 that their bodies, their, their skull morphology ties into their hunting style. Like I said, ambush predators, they're usually killing, ideally, as quickly as possible. A lot of cats go for a killing bite. Mm -hmm. And typically, when they're doing this... They are either, if it's a smaller prey animal, will go for the back of the neck. Yes. Just one, and you're done. Or, for bigger prey, they'll often go for the throat or over the face. Yeah. And if I sound muffled, it's because I'm demonstrating. And the point of this is to suffocate the prey. Which, the first time I ever saw that happen was both bizarre, because that's a, that's a crazy way I'm going to bite your snout. Yeah, I'm going to bite your mouth. And also horrifying. <laughs> yeah, the cats, this is what they... It's hard to, to really recognize it when you look at your cat mm -hmm. at home and they're like curled with their head turned upside down uh, and then they like fall off the stairs. Yep. <laughs> but no, these are like highly honed killing machines. Built for murder. <laughs> Another thing about cat skulls, especially... And the teaser image we posted on social media for August is a cat skull and a dog skull. Mm -hmm. And one of the most obvious differences is their eyes. Oh my goodness. Cat eyes are huge. Big eyes. Big eyes, forward facing. What big eyes you have. What big eyes? Yes, all the better to uh, bite your face with. <laughs> Cat eyes are not only big, but they face forward. Yes. Which means they have stereoscopic vision, binocular vision. Binocular vision means that your eyes are facing the same direction, which means a portion of the field in front of you, both eyes can see the same thing. And a very large portion compared to your typical animal where they're more on the side. Exactly. And if you both eyes can see the same thing, your brain can calculate distance much more readily, which is great if you have to pounce or chase or climb in a tree. Mm -hmm. Depth perception's kind of important. If leaping's a big part of what you do, it helps. I saw a paper, one paper that I saw described that cats have 120 degrees of overlap in their vision. So if you picture the 360 degree circle around a cat's face, uh, the front 120 degrees are overlap, which that paper said is the best we see in mammals outside of primates. Yep. And I, when I Googled the, this question, Google told me that humans also have 120 degrees. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, if my sources are accurate... Cats have binocular vision about as good as ours. Yeah. And the only thing that beats cats is certain primates. Uh, cats cats famously also, many of them have elliptical pupils that can expand to allow in more light or close out more light. Those slit eyes. They have reflective layers in the back of the eye. The tapetum lucidum, which is why their eyes shine when light is, is shined upon them. For night vision. Which reflects light back onto their light sensing cells. So that the cells are basically getting a double dose of light, which reduces focus, but lets you see. Speaking of senses, another interesting thing about cats is that they have specialized hairs on their face called the brisse. Whiskers? Whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> Whiskers are these particularly thick hairs that are normally rooted deep in the skin, and they sit in little fluid-filled sacks full of nerves. Yeah. So that if something disturbs the whisker, the cat can feel it. This is actually carnivorans in general. Uh, dogs, bears, pinnipeds tend to have whiskers, typically on the cheeks, above the eyes, on the snout, and in some, uh, and cats typically tend not to have this, below the chin. Though now that I'm thinking about it, I have had cats that would have like a random whisker yeah. sticking out, which I assume is like a domestication breeding thing. Could be. I don't know what the, the, the cat stats are yeah. on whiskers. Cats have good hearing, especially among small cats. Their high-frequency sound hearing is good because you're hunting things that squeak. Cats have good smell, although in terms of their brain power and their nerve density, they're about half the smell power of dogs, who are, of course, famous Ooh, yeah. for their ability to smell. <laughs> Tune in next episode. <laughs> 
Cats, also, another thing that's interesting about cats while we're running down a list of, of add-ons, cats are fairly notable for having a lot of fur patterns. Yeah. Spots and blotches and stripes. This is the norm among cats to be all spotty and blotchy as compared to like dogs here in the Americas, wolves, jackals, coyotes. You typically think of them as being more flatly colored or where it's like you have, you know, your back and your belly are a different color, but then there's just kind of this gradient. Yeah. You know, while cats have distinct patterns, that is a stripe clear lines (laughs) on either side. And that, seems to be mostly there has actually been a ton of study on this cool of why they have those patterns how far back they go i've seen studies that suggest the ancestral conditions for cats was splotchy Mm -hmm. Uh, typically this tracks habitat so if you are in a habitat where you can hide either from predators or prey you're going to be all blotchy and spotty whereas if you are in an open habitat which is where a lot of canids are doing their Mm -hmm. hunting it's also where like Lions and say. sand cats, yeah. which tend to be a little, you know, more flat in color. Yeah, lions on the savanna, tiger in a forest. Yep. You can see the distinction there. Speaking of habits, another comparison with dogs, cats tend to be ex- solitary, mm-hmm. fiercely territorial. These are not like we live in groups, we have friends. These are don't bother me unless we're mating. Yes. <laughs> That's it. There are three main exceptions. Lions. Yep. Which are the exception. Yeah, and like, not only are they, they the exception, they're often the example of <laughs> group oh, yeah. hunting. Yeah, right? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. This this group of animals that is known for not group hunting, <laughs> except for lions, male cheetahs, yes. will hunt in groups, and then the only other species of cat that is known for group living is house cats. Yeah. Because we did that. Because of cat people. There is one other note about cat anatomy and behavior that I want to mention because it's just this weird, funny little thing. One of the kind of, sort of, often cited differences, Will's smiling, he knows where I'm going with this, I think, between big cats and small cats is that big cats roar, but can't purr, and small cats purr, but can't roar. Yep, I, I... Can't even remember how many times I've heard that. (laughs) So purring is actually this unusual thing that small cats do. And if you've ever held a cat, it's that rhythmic vibration. Big cats apparently can't do this, but small cats meow. (laughs) Yeah. They don't. Now, this is not like an actual, as far as I know, black and white Mm -mm. defining feature. Partially because... The definition of what a roar and a purr is yes. is very difficult to actually. But there does seem to be a general trend that there is a difference in the vocal folds, yeah. the vocal cords of big cats versus small cats. We mentioned this briefly, briefly when we did the uh, bioacoustics episode. Oh yes, 52. Mm-hmm. Episode 52. But it comes up a lot and it's one of those that is kind of true. Yeah. Like a little bit true. A fun little generalization that does eventually break down. (laughs) So overall, cats, very unique, very interesting group of animals. Like we said, highly conservative of form. Yes. Like the cheetah I've seen described as the most specialized cat. Yeah. In terms of its body form. And even a cheetah, I can't imagine you surprising someone by pointing at a cheetah and saying, yeah, that's one of, that's a cat. They go, no, the, yeah, that, that's a cat. Yeah, it's it's a weird looking cat. It's got a big nose. It's got long limbs. It's a slender body, but it's a cat. And like I said at the beginning, cats are mammals. So let's talk a bit about where they fit in the grand scheme of mammal evolution. Yeah, where in mammalia? Where this is a section that I've titled. Uh, our patrons see this when we post director's notes that I like to put titles on my yes. sections, which is just for me. No one ever sees these. Uh, this is a section that I have called, Where Does It Fits? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Cats are carnivorans. Carnivora is the group that includes most of your major groups of mam- placental mammal predators. Yes. It's not the only group with carnivores in it. Nope. The Tasmanian devils are not in this group. Bats. Bats are predators. There are cetaceans, you know, yeah. dolphins. But... It, it has enough of the carnivores that early taxonomists named this group Carnivora. Yeah, and it's it's a good name. 
There are two main groups within Carnivora. On the one hand, the Caniforms. Yep. And the other hand, the Filiforms. <laughs> yeah. Makes it, it nice and easy to remember. It's it's a it's a convenient split. The Caniformia includes canids, dogs, wolves, yep. jackals, etc. Bears, uh, pinnipeds, which are your seals, sea lions, and walruses. Mm -hmm. Mustelloids, so pandas, skunks, raccoons. And then the true mustelids, which red are... Red pandas. Uh, red pandas, skunks, and raccoons. <laughs> yes, you're right. Red pandas, skunks, and raccoons. Uh, pandas are in the, the giant pandas are in the ursids, the bears. Yes. <laughs> and then mustelids, which are weasels, wolverines, badgers, etc. The feliform side of the carnivora family tree includes felids, cats, yep. African civets, the verids, which are uh, other civets, genets, and the bear cat. Yeah. Hyenas, uh, mongooses, and meerkats, fossas, which we talked about in episode 40 of Madagascar. Yeah. And linsangs. Now, I mentioned linsang specifically. The, the Asiatic linsang is a small animal from Asia that's kind of cat, kind of mongoose. Like, it's a, it's like a cat weasel. Mm -hmm. They're relatively small. They're about a foot, 30 centimeters long, uh, uh, beak to behind. They are considered, generally speaking, the closest living relatives of cats. Okay, okay. Carnivora first evolve best we can tell, in the Paleocene, which is going back over 55 million years ago, shortly after the end of the Mesozoic, uh, shortly into the Age of Mammals. Mm -hmm. The earliest carnivorans in the fossil record are small, sort of civet-like, uh, which, you know, kind of small, marten, weasel, mongoose kind of looking animals. And they stay that way through the Paleocene and the Eocene, so the first several million years of the Age of Mammals. And part of the reason that they stay that way might be because at that time there were other dominant groups of mammal carnivores. Yeah. Mesonychids, which includes things like Andrusarchus, I believe, and Creodonts. There were these non-carnivoran other mammal predators. In the late Eocene to early Oligocene, so we're looking at like around 40 to 35 million years ago, we start to see the rise of familiar groups of carnivorans. Notably, for example, the first dog cousins Yay. show up in North America around this time. Meanwhile, in Europe and Asia, we see the earliest cat cousins. In fact, there are fossils from France and Mongolia around this time that represent an ancient, uh, ancient representatives of the group called aileroids, which includes cats, hyenas, mongooses, and civets. Most of these are small predators, less than 5 kilograms, so, you know, 12, 15 pounds or so. So, house cat-sized. They have hypercarnivorous dentition already, and this includes a bunch of different small critters, Paleoprionodon, Stenogale, Stenoplazictus, and it is within this group of ancient aileroids that starts, that is, you know, Eocene into the Oligocene, that we see a genus called Proalurus, which is generally considered the first cat. It is the oldest known cat in the fossil record. And we will start our journey through the fossil history of cats with Proalurus after this short break. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Proalurus was a carnivoran, an aileroid, about the size of a bobcat, and roughly the shape of one, that lived during the late Oligocene into the Miocene, so we're looking at 30 to 20 million years ago, remains found in Europe and Asia. This is an animal that if you saw it today, you'd probably go, that's a cat. Mm -hmm. Stocky, relatively short limbs, flexible body, Somewhat reduced dentition and short snout, although not quite as short and reduced as we see in modern cats. So a toothy cat. A slightly toothier, snoutier cat. Not quite as specialized. I've seen a handful of sources suggest that it probably had features like retractable claws, like blotchy coat patterns, since those are expected to be things that we see in cats. This is the first cat. Felids have gotten their start by the start of the Miocene epoch, 
shortly after 30 million years ago in Europe, Europe, Asia, Eurasia. After Proaluris and possibly descended from Proaluris, we see a next group called Pseudaluris. <laughs> now, at this point, there may be some people out there going, uh, hang on, I thought Aluris was the name of the genus for red pandas. Yeah. And yes, it is, because Aluris means cat, because taxonomic names are given by scientists, and sometimes scientists name things, and it's weird. Because <laughs> sometimes scientists are silly, too. Sometimes we're silly people, and we don't think of how it's going to sound confusing <laughs> later on. <laughs> or we don't know what we're talking about. Yes. I have seen Pseudaluris, the genus Pseudaluris, referred to as a complex, because it, it includes several species and probably several genera. There's been a lot of, it sounds like, discussion about identification mm -hmm. of the different Pseudaluruses. So it's not likely a, a, a nice, neat, actual group. It is definitely not a nice, neat, actual group. It is basically the bunch of early cats that were around from the early to middle Miocene, so 20 to 12 million years ago. They ranged from house cat size to bobcat sized. All right. So small to medium small. They have more cat-like dentition. They're a little more familiar. But what makes the Pseudaluris group especially notable is that they represent a radiation of cats. Uh, they spread out. This group is found in Europe and Asia, in the Middle East, and North America. Hey! They move over to North America, where they join uh, early dogs and bears, who were already over there. They are not in South America yet, because remember the Gabby episode? Yes. Episode 43, you, you can't do that yet. Yeah, the Americas weren't talking yet. This is a very broad group, the Pseudaluris and friends, thought to possibly, probably, maybe be the ancestors of all following cats. Mm -hmm. And it is from this group that we see the diversification of cats as we know them. I mentioned in the beginning of the episode that there are those eight modern lineages of cats. Genetic data suggests that those all branch off between about 11 and 6 million years ago. All right. So middle to late Miocene, we are seeing the branching and diversifying of cats. The pantherines, the big cats, are thought to have split earliest, according to recent genetic research, back at about 11 million years and the leopard cat group and the domestic cat group are thought to have split around six. Uh, which, uh, if I remember correctly, is actually also roughly the time that gorillas split and then chimps and humans split. Oh, uh, yeah. So we're on, like, a, a similar ape trajectory. Yeah, yeah. However, despite those early splits, the fossil records of most of these lineages aren't particularly great, especially early on. There are fossils of wild cats, caracals, ocelots, leopard cats, bobcats. Some, like bobcats, are fairly well known uh, in, in certain parts of their fossil record. Many of these small ones are poorly known. I saw one article that pointed out that bay cats are just not known, <laughs> which kind of makes sense for an, an island in Yes, group. no. But we don't necessarily, especially farther back, have a great record of the small cats. We have a better record of big cats. Yeah, big things are more robust a lot of the time. They survive better, and they're collected more and researched more. As they, they are a cooler thing to find. They are cooler. <laughs> the early evolution of big cats is largely unknown. If they did indeed split from the rest of the, the modern cats around 10 to 11 million years ago, we don't have several million years of their fossil record. Gotcha. There, there's a ghost lineage, as we call it. The earliest known pantherine, the oldest known uh, big cat, was actually named and identified in 2013. Oh, wow. Panthera blythe from Tibet at about 4.4 million years old. And indeed, this supports the fact that uh, DNA evidence suggests that big cats may have originated in Asia. Prior to that discovery, the oldest evidences of big cats were in Africa. Okay. And indeed, one site that is particularly famous for its big cat remains is the Laetoli site in Tanzania, which dates to about 3.7 million years ago. So now we're in the Pliocene. We are uh, out of the Miocene epoch. If, you, if you're thinking, hey, Laetoli sounds familiar, that's because it is famous for hominin footprints. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A very famous site for, for early hominins but it also has fragments and footprints of cats, including 
uh, what appears to be cheetah, and big cats that are, at the very least, the size of lions and leopards. Yeah. If not necessarily actually lions and leopards. Makes sense. As we move forward in the Pliocene and into the Pleistocene, so within the last few million years, we see fossils showing up in Europe and Asia, representing cheetahs and jaguars moving north. True leopards and lions are known from the early Pleistocene in Africa, as uh, back to two million years ago at least, and then both of those spread north. So we end up with European leopards and cave lions. Yeah. So by the early Pleistocene, so by two million years ago or so, we are seeing cats moving from Africa and so at least southern Asia and spreading across the northern reaches of the Old World into what is more familiar cat territory today. And some of them make the trip across the hemisphere to the Americas. Woo! Jaguars, it seems, probably made it over to the Americas by the early Pleistocene, by which time they could also then move down to South America, where yes. they remain today. Book it all the way. The Puma lineage also makes it over there and includes not only the uh, cougars, but also the genus Miracinonyx. The American Cheetah. Yeah. Let's talk about the American Cheetah for just a second, because it's one of the cool, famous examples. Starting in the early Pleistocene, so a couple million years ago, we start to see the remains of this American Cheetah, which is cougar-like, as you might expect, but has longer limbs, shorter skull, large nasal openings, which are all features we see in cheetahs. All features that are good for running. Yeah. And for a while, it was thought that they were cheetahs. But more recent evidence is suggesting that they actually are a convergent group that separately evolved sort of what looked like cursorial, right, running habits within the same group that also includes African cheetahs. Which is even cooler. Now, whether or not they were actually fast, or how fast they were, is a question that is difficult to answer. But there is also the, the famous story, which may or may not be true, that North America happens to also be home to pronghorns. Yes, it is. And pronghorns are real fast. They are the animal that's able to maintain their top speed for the longest amount of time out of all the running animals. Interesting. That it's a fast top speed and they can maintain it longer than most. And the story you'll often hear, because it's a fun little story, is that that is weird because there's nothing in North America that can chase that. Yeah, remotely. So when we discovered that there used to be a cheetah-type animal here, it's easy to imagine that maybe that the pronghorn evolved to avoid mm -hmm. those fast carnivores who we have since lost. Yes. Now, it is very difficult to know if that's actually true. To find solid support for that. But it is certainly a fun thing to think about. We don't know how fast the, quote, American cheetahs were. No. We need to find some pronghorn bones with American cheetah bites on it. Yes, we need to find American cheetah footprints that go, like, uh, over 200 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and measure their stride length. And this mile of, of trackway <laughs> has 12 footprints. Now. <laughs> and while we're talking about impressive cats that made it to the Americas, lions also made it here? Yeah. It's thought that a branch of European lions made it to North America by, you know, a few hundred thousand years ago, and eventually gave rise to Panthera atrox. Panthera atrox! The American lion. Cool name for a cool animal. Panthera atrox is famous for being enormous. Big. Big, big cat. I have seen numbers that have suggested, you know, up to a meter or more, four feet or so at the shoulder. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And weight estimates I've seen range 300 to 400 kilograms. So again, we're in the like 700 to 900 pound range. So we're talking about something that is not enormous compared to like a tiger. No. Possibly the biggest cat ever, or at least among the biggest cats ever. Yeah. Cats are an interesting group where like, we're so used to having examples from the past of like, here's an animal that was way bigger than what we have yeah. today. Right? Megalodon was twice like... Twice as big as the biggest one we have. Twice as big. Cats, tigers today are a pretty close to the max we've ever seen from cats. 
But what's real impressive about Panthera Aatrox, I've gotten to see casts of the Panthera Aatrox skull Mm -hmm. next to tigers and lions. And this is a big, beefy animal. Yeah. These are huge. And then towards the end of the Pleistocene, we lose a lot of this cat diversity. Why? Well, for episode 25, (laughs) (laughs) we lose a lot of big animals at the end of the Pleistocene. Yes, megafaunal extinction. Megafaunal extinction rids a lot of Europe. Uh, Well, Europe basically gets rid of its big cats. North America loses a bunch of its big cats. The American cheetah and lion vanish, which is a shame. Major shame. Real big shame. But it means that by the time we get out of the Pleistocene, by the time we're at about 10,000 years ago, we basically have cats as we know them. They're in the places we know. We have the species we know. They look right. They're in the right spots. Cats as you would expect. There is one major thing that happens to cats in the last 10,000 years to finalize the picture. But before we get to that, (laughs) some of our listeners at this point might be saying, Now, hang on a second. Whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) Whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel like... I'm no expert, but I feel like you're missing something. (laughs) Something important has been skipped. (laughs) And, yeah, you're right. Let's rewind the clock. Let's go back to the Miocene. Proaelurus, early Felid. After that, the Pseudaelurus complex, through the Miocene, gives rise to later cats. And indeed, as I said, the Pseudaelurus group's Give, seem to give rise, or at least are followed by, the earliest representatives of modern cat groups, the Felinae and the Pantherinae. But that's not the only cats they give rise to. Nope. I have seen the Felinae and Pantherinae, modern cats, grouped together under the name conical-toothed cats, <laughs> which refers to their upper canines, especially the canines, but upper canines especially, being cone-shaped, yeah, as we discussed. round in cross-section. Round and sort of traffic cone-like. To differentiate them from the other major group of cats that arises at this point, the Macarodontines. Mm-hmm. The saber-toothed cats. Yes! These are cats whose upper canines are long and pointy and often flat. Yeah. Not cone-shaped, but knife-shaped. Yeah, more Zipodont-esque. In the middle to late Miocene, starting around 12 million years ago or so, we start to see cats like Macaridus. Also, its friends Paramacaridus and Amphimacaridus, there's a bunch of (laughs) Macaridus, show up in Africa and Eurasia, later make it to North America. These are often leopard-sized to lion-sized saber-toothed cats. Now, before we move on there, these are not the only saber-toothed animals. No, they're not even the only saber-toothed cat-like animals. No. This is a recurring theme. Early in the Cenozoic, way back in the Eocene Oligocene, there is a group of either early carnivorans or near-early carnivorans called the Nimrabids, Woo! which I believe are often called false saber-toothed cats, Yes, which lived in Europe and North America, uh, including things like Nimravis, Hoplophonius, Eusmilus. After the Nimravids reign in the Miocene, we see Barbarophilids, which were once considered Nimravids, and then once considered Felids, and now I think they're considered just outside of true cats. All right. Another group of very cat-like, saber-toothed animals. These are, are known Afrosmilus from Africa, Sansanosmilus from Europe, the famous Barbarophilus from North America. These are on the way out in the late Miocene, around the time the Macarodontine true cat saber-tooths are showing up. But even before the Cenozoic, there were synapsids in the Permian, episode 47, with saber teeth for a predatory lifestyle. Yeah, gorgonopsids and stuff like that. Yeah, this is a winning strategy. And even among saber tooth predators in the Cenozoic, like you might think, well, this is a specialized thing. I saw one paper that cited that often we will see two or three saber tooth species in an ecosystem. Yes. This is just what this was a thing this is what big predators did pretty consistently throughout history and indeed most of cat history has been if not dominated by at least significantly including large saber-toothed cats which is why it's such a a weird situation that we are in where we have 
no particularly saber-toothed big predators these days. This is true. We've lost them. And it's why that question of what they were doing with it is so important because it was obviously successful. So why is it not being successful now? Very true. We'll talk about that in a second. I should mention that Macarodontines, the saber-toothed cats, are also not the only saber-toothed cats. Mm -hmm. There are other branches within Felids that may or may not be part of the Macarodontine group. You have Nimravides from North America. You have the Methalurines. The point is, they're the Miocene cats hit upon the saber-tooth idea and ran with it. We have this incredible diversity of saber-tooth cats throughout the Miocene. And indeed, I mentioned earlier that we don't have a good early record of big cats. Mm -hmm. Some authors have suggested that maybe the reason we don't see a lot of fossils of big cats early on is because those ecosystems were dominated by saber-toothed cats. Uh... That either competition with saber-toothed cats kept big cats rare and small, or kept big cats in ecosystems that don't fossilize very well. Like, if they're out in the mountains of Tibet, yes, we're not likely to see a lot of those. And this is the group big cats, not large felines. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. The big, well, the big and, cats. And the large, non-saber-toothed feline, exactly. I guess, you know. Because the saber-toothed yeah. were large themselves, but yes. they were keeping <laughs> those other groups. The pantherines. Either potentially from getting large or being large where they were. Exactly. Until later on where they start to overlap. So you have your early Macaridus and friends in the Miocene, and then moving into the Pliocene and Pleistocene, so starting, you know, five million years ago or so, the saber-toothed cats, the Macarodontines, split into two main groups. Mm -hmm. The Homo therini, also known as the scimitar-toothed cats. Yeah. Which is a, that's a, a good oh, name. I love that name so much. These cats have canines that are relatively shorter. They're still saber teeth, but they're shorter than their compatriots we'll talk about in a second. They look more reasonable. They are coarsely serrated, so they, they have noticeably jagged edges. Yeah. Like a steak knife. Yeah, saw teeth. In terms of their bodies, these are also a bit more gracile of their limbs, a bit slenderer, possibly uh, for more cursorial habits, more, more running and moving. Not necessarily cheetah-like, but more, perhaps, open habitats, more walking around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the old world, you have the famous Homotherium. And here in the, the Americas, we have things like Dinobastis and Xenosmilus. The other group are the Smilodontini. Oh, hey, I know that name. The Dirk-toothed cats. Which is also a very cool name for a group. Yes, it is. Compared to the Homotherium group, these have longer canines. And they have small, uh, and sometimes no serrations on the, the canines at all. They also tend to be more robust and stout of limb. These are more of the ambush predator morphology. Pounce and grab. In the old world, we have uh, cats like Megantarion. And here in the Americas, we have cats like Smilodon. Hey, we've mentioned that one once or twice. Once or twice. I'm pretty sure we mentioned it in episode 67 about the La Brea Tar Pits, because they have three thousand of them a few when you picture saber tooth cats smilodon is the cat like it think of saber tooth cat artwork this is probably the cat you have in mind but well, as tyrannosaurus is to theropods yes smilodon is to saber tooth cats absolutely it's the famous one it's the most recent it's among the most recent it lived in north america it overlapped with humans yeah a lot of these later cats overlapped with people Smilodon's canines, to give you a sense of, I said they're longer, Smilodon's saber teeth grew up to 11 inches, or 28 <laughs> centimeters. That is a foot. Just shy of a foot. A foot of teeth. <sighs> now, often we will find Smilodontine, dirk-toothed cats, and Homotherian, scimitar-toothed cats, in the same habitats which suggests that they may have been partitioning a bit. Maybe yep. one was doing more the ambush and one was doing more the chase or something like that. That makes sense if you have generally different body designs that you could niche partition pretty effectively. So saber-toothed cats, Miocene into the Pleistocene, the, you know, most, much of the last 10 to 15 million years were at least as widespread and diverse as modern groups of cats. They were in the same places, 
They occupied similar habitats. There were a bunch of them all over the place. Like I said, saber-toothedness is a successful... It, I saw one article that was pointing out that it's easy to look at a saber-toothed cat and go, wow, what a weird specialized morphology. What strange niche must you have occupied? Mm -hmm. And the reality seems to be that they didn't occupy some strange niche, that that was a good, successful way to be. Yeah, what strange niche did you occupy? All of them. All of them. Everyone I wanted, for I am a cat. Which raises the question, why the long teeth? <laughs> what? <laughs> that was the appropriate amount of laughing. <laughs> what, what, are you, what are you doing with them? Yeah, how in the world are you putting those to use? Part of the answer comes from the fact, might come from the fact that not only are the, the teeth convergent in multiple different groups that have evolved them independently, but other features tend to go along with them. So not only are the, the canines tend to be big and often flat, side to side, knife shaped, there, tend, there are often uh, bony flaring on the lower jaw, the, these sort of flanges that probably help to support the tooth. Yeah, that match up where the tooth is while the jaw is closed. Saber-toothed cats and saber-toothed not-quite-cats and saber-toothed not-cats at all also often will have larger incisors. Mm -hmm. Big, canana-form incisors, because you don't sharp. have normal canines, so your incisors are acting like normal canines. Often the cheek teeth are reduced and very blade-like. Uh, and indeed, Smilodon, I believe, I didn't double-check this, I believe has among the fewest teeth of any cat. Oh, wow. I think the cheek teeth are more reduced in Smilodon uh, and possibly other saber teeth, saber tooth cats than in most other cats. So seems like we are going yet further on this hyper carnivorous route. Saber toothed cats and other saber toothed things also tend to have a very wide gape of their jaw, which makes perfect sense. Yes, because it would be weird if you didn't. Well, it would be useless if you didn't. Exactly. Modern cats, according to one source I read, uh, tend to have a about 65 degree gape. Right? They're able to open their jaws about that much. Smilodon is fam famously could open its jaws more than 90 degrees. That's a, that's a lot of mouth. <laughs> Saber tooth predators also tend to have large neck muscles, possibly to help with positioning and stabilizing. But also per, uh, for adding strength to the bite, because a wide gape can weaken your bite. Yes. Uh, this is, you, you, you can test, that this is a simple mechanical test. If something is open more widely, it's harder to close it. Well, it's, uh, find a door in a hallway and open it all the way to the wall and then put, like, a rope on the doorknob and stand in the door and try to pull the door shut. Yep. It takes forever until you get to a certain point and then it swings shut because now... The mechanism's working the right way. So it seems like there are common features to saber-toothed predators, which may be related to how they're using their teeth. Now, there have been lots of suggestions. Uh, one, uh, some early suggestions for saber-toothed cats was maybe they're just for getting through tough hides. Mm -hmm. If you're hunting mammoths or ground sloths, that's a lot of skin to get through. Maybe you just need a long knife. Which you can see depicted in lots of classic paleo art. Yeah, but them just stabbing. Yeah, on the back of a mammoth or a, you know, woolly rhino and just digging in. Yep. There was at least one suggestion, I think, sometime of saber-toothed cats sucking blood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> With their long canines. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is at least one saber-toothed cat named Vampirictus, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. Yeah, worth it. But uh, one of the issues that has been pointed out for saber tooth cats as just rampant stabbers is that their teeth aren't made of steel. Mm -hmm. They're not adamantium teeth. They can break. And we find fossils of saber tooth cats with broken canines. If, you, if you're if you jumping on the back of a bison and shoving your teeth into it, it's not sitting still. It's wiggling and mm -hmm. writhing and trying to get away from you, and you're going to break your teeth. Well, and when you take your teeth and you flatten them into blades, that makes it really good for cutting and stabbing yep. and slicing in but you've also reduced the strength side to side. It's now thin. And the cats we have today, big cats today especially, have 
round teeth, which adds to that strength. There's not many shapes stronger than a cone. <laughs> so more recent suggestions have been that perhaps the saber teeth, following in the logic of what we see big cats do today, cats today tend to go for a killing bite. Mm -hmm. So perhaps saber teeth were doing a similar thing, that those long teeth, whether you're hunting big prey or not, are good for reaching critical points. For example, we mentioned today that cats tend to go for the neck or the throat. Yes. Well, if you have 11 inch long teeth like Smilodon and you go for the throat, you're going to hit all the important stuff. Or even if you're not severing all the arteries and the, the, the windpipes and stuff, you get your teeth in there and then pull. Yeah. And you have de-throated your, your prey. So it could be that they were just even better tools for doing what cats do normally anyway. Yeah, because a lot of big cats today, not all, but like a, a lot of big cat bites to those vital areas are still very much like a crushing. Yeah. I, I am suffocating. suffocating by crushing your trachea. And so you can't breathe. Or, or I'm a jaguar and I bite through your brain case. Cause well, because <laughs> yeah, some, some cats don't play by anybody's rules. But if you have knives instead, now it's more of an assassin's bite. Yeah. I am going in and precisely hitting yeah. the it's, parts it's a, that will kill you. It's a surgical strike. Exactly. And perhaps in support of that, you know, when we see cats today, they're grapplers. Mm -hmm. They're wrestlers. Like I said, when you see your cat play with a toy, they grab it and fall over. And this is... Shorter, stockier limbs are good for that. They can turn their hands in to grab a thing. They grapple prey and wrestle it down and hold it while they go for the killing bite. Sabertooth cats have often especially beefy arms. Yeah. Especially Smilodon and the Dirktooth cats. These are like 1980s action movie arms. Well, that's what I was going to say is like, while, you know, uh, 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 well, the cats are generally like wrestlers. Smilodon's like Dave Batista. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Cats are generally Chris Evans. <laughs> but Smilodon is Dave Batista. It's Captain America versus Drax. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it may very well be that saber-toothed cats were just doing what cats do, but better. I actually saw a, a, a couple of references to the fact that cats have a lot of nerves Modern cats have a lot of nerves around the base of their canines, mm -hmm. which might help them feel around to position their bite. Uh, yeah, that makes, like, avoiding yeah. bone and aiming for soft spots. Yeah. That's cool. Sabertooth cats existed pretty much the whole run of cats, from the Miocene to almost today. But we mentioned the late Pleistocene, we see a lot of extinctions, and those extinctions gradually across the world, take out the saber-toothed cats. Because even if, as you said, they're doing what cats do but better, that's still taking a feature and going to the extreme of it. And extremes typically don't do well during extinctions. And as we've talked about in our extinction episodes, it also could just be that they were unlucky. Yeah. There's always, a li there's o there's always the chance of a degree of luck with these things. And saber-toothed cats didn't make it. We do not have saber-toothed cats today. The latest ones, cats like Smilodon, made it all the way to the end, uh, around 10,000 years ago, overlapped with humans, certainly in the Old World, and even in North America and, uh, and possibly South America. It might be that there's some competition going on, like we see saber-toothed cats dwindling in Europe and Asia as cave lions spread through there. Maybe there are probably lots of factors in play, but again, now we are back where we were. 10,000 years ago, and cats look modern. We have the modern groups, we have the modern genera, they're in the modern places, none of them have saber teeth. It looks like modern cats. And then, one more thing happens. <laughs> there is a site on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus that dates back to around 9,500 years ago, or, since this is so recent, it's often described as 7,500 B.C., where there is a human burial site, a human in a grave, alongside the skeleton of an eight-month-old, at its death, cat. It's a kitten. Now, there are two important notes about this. Number one, cats don't live on Cyprus. <laughs> this had to have been taken there. And number two, the cat isn't, like, alongside this human randomly. The human is buried in a grave, and the cat, as I read one article describe it, is buried in its own tiny grave. <laughs> Next to the human. 
oriented the same direction as the human. This is generally considered the first solid archaeological evidence of cat domestication. Mm -hmm. Later on, especially in places like Egypt and the Middle East, we start to see more cat evidence. By 3,600 years ago, we see art in Egypt that not only shows cats, but it shows cats like under people's chairs and on collars and eating out of bowls. By 2,900 years ago, Egyptians at the very least were breeding cats for worship and sacrifice. Humans, over the course of these last several thousand years, domesticated cats. Mm -hmm. Exactly how and why they domesticated cats is a little bit hard to know because it's really hard to tell a domesticated animal's bone from a not domesticated animal's bone, especially cats because they're so similar to their wild relatives. But genetics have been a big help. DNA data has taught us that the modern domestic cat is descended from the African wildcat, which is Felis libica, or Felis sylvestris libica, again, depending on whose taxonomy you're going, which lives natively in Africa and Asia. I've seen references to other wildcats being tamed or kind or maybe living alongside humans, but the most the recent research seems to suggest that modern cats are all descended from this one, like house cats, mm -hmm. are descended from this one group. The question of why and how cats got domesticated is also tricky and interesting because cats are not good candidates for domestication. They don't fit a lot of the, the categories that you typically look for. We talked in episode 27 about what makes an animal good for domestication, right? Domesticated animals tend to be group social animals, which cats are not. They are almost exclusively solitary and fiercely territorial. Yeah, antisocial. <laughs> antisocial. They have no social structure, and particularly notable, no hierarchical social structure. Which is also very important. Which is how humans are able to domesticate things. You step into the role of the, the creature in charge. Yes. Like, dogs take orders. Cattle take orders. Cats do not take orders. They still don't take orders particularly well. <laughs> they are, I, I've seen places describe them as uncooperative. <laughs> yes. Also, they're obligate carnivores. Like, a horse, it's like, okay, you're a big animal, but at the very least, it's easy to find food for yeah, you. Yeah, but I have a yard. Like, a dog will eat what you throw at it. Cats are harder to feed. So there's been a lot of discussion about what exactly happened to bring cats into domestication, right? Dogs, it's easy. It's, okay, social structure... They, they were domesticated very early on, as we'll, we'll discuss Yo. in the future. Cats seem to show up around humans around the same time as the earliest human settlements, which seems to suggest that they are related to the act of human farming. Humans start farming, they start storing things like grain, which attracts mice. Yes, it does. Mice become habituated to human settlements, and where as you they still are. As they still are. And where you have mice, you're going to attract predators. So it may be that cats followed their prey into these human areas. And once that happened, you would get some natural selection for cats who are able to coexist with humans. Or at the very least, not attack each other. Cats that are a little more tame, a little more ready to walk down the street when oh, there's yeah, humans in there are less likely for us to chase off. You know, if you hiss and scratch it, I'm going to take the broom to you every single time I see you. Right. If you don't, well, then, yeah, eat the mice. Then you can exploit this new habitat full of food. So it may be that humans at first tolerated cats. If they're eating pests, humans may even have encouraged. Mm -hmm. Like, sure, no, come on in, cats. Let them stay in the barn. <laughs> How do they're... I get one of those? How... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then eventually maybe started keeping them because a thing that I, I see pointed out a lot is that cats are cute. Yes. They're little and they're fluffy and they're cute. And it's probably, and humans are very social caretaking kinds of creatures. I saw a post once talking about when people <laughs> do things because they feel bad for like an appliance. Yeah. You know, like I, a, a story <laughs> of someone buying one that was in a beat up box because they were worried no one else would. Yep. Or and, people apologizing to inanimate objects. Yep. And <laughs> someone at the bottom said, man, humans will pack bond with anything. We sure will. <laughs> and so I've seen it described 
that uh, cats kind of domesticated themselves. I was going to if you didn't have it written down, I was going to say I, that's yeah. how I've heard it described many a time. They kind of adapted to living alongside humans and humans tolerated and encouraged until eventually we were just sort of companions living mm -hmm. in the same places alongside each other. DNA evidence suggests that there was a long history of domestic cats interbreeding and breeding with wild cats, that it wasn't like humans took them out of the wild completely and then pinned them up and bred them. They kind of gradually became the domesticated cats we know today. And indeed, even still today, cats are still very cat-like. Mm -hmm. They're not like dogs. Dogs were bred for jobs. They were bred for purposes. They do specific things, and as a result of that, they're very extreme in the body modifications. Yes. Cats are basically cats. If you kick your cat out, it's probably going to do fine in the woods. Early cat breeds seem to have happened by accident. So, like, cats were carried over to East Asia, and then they were no longer interbreeding with other cats. And now you had a uh, isolated gene pool. So you ended up with East Asian cat breeds. It isn't until the 1800s that the modern breeds of cats we have today, for the most part, show up. And they're bred not for jobs, but for aesthetic. Yeah, now we're doing it on purpose, but it's just because it's neat. And that might be why they're still so cat like we've only bred them to look different not to behave As or yes. act or do a job or something and this has ended up in the situation that wasn't true 10,000 years ago that the domestic cat often referred to as Felis catus is arguably the most successful cat species that has ever existed <laughs> they are found on every continent except antarctica probably as we've mentioned domestic cats have made it to parts of the, the world that other cats have never made it to, like Australia. Unfortunately. They are the most widespread, the most numerous, because they hitchhiked on the success of humans, or perhaps humans carried them along in their success. It has also made this species of cat one of the most devastating species on the planet. They are terrible invasive species. They are... I have seen them ranked multiple places as the number one worst invasive species on the planet. Because what we have done is we have taken these knife slinkies who 30 million years of cat evolution has honed into this cat assassin, right? T-Rex doesn't want to be fed. <laughs> he wants to hunt. <laughs> and they're still like that. They are expert hunters. They're still stealthy. They still have all the senses. They still have the body form for that. And it means that... A huge proportion of domestic cats are not domestic. Yeah. They're feral. They're yes. out in the wild. And there are studies that have shown that they have an absolutely terrible impact on local environments. Well, it's because while well, like other animals, other domesticated animals, when they are let loose, will also go feral. But they are usually still distinct from... You know, they're still a distinct domestic species. Right. Most feral dogs are still dogs. They're still, and they're, they're, they don't go back to the wild and become wolves. Right. But cats are, like, they are technically domesticated, but just barely. They're, they're not, they never stop being wild cats. And so it's very, it's much more similar in my mind to, like, the color morphs and breeds of snake yeah. That you find in certain pet shops that are bred for different patterns and colorations and, you know, odd feature scalelessness and weird stuff like that. Yeah. But they're all still just, you know, ball pythons. And so if you take those as popular pets all over the world, when they get out, they're still just <laughs> yep. a ball python, still a python that's now going to go eat what by ball pythons eat in this new place. It's cats. I've seen... At least one study each in Canada, the U.S., and Australia that have surveyed, like, domestic cat hunting behaviors yeah. and found that they kill billions, yes. like, billions of small animals per year in each country. Yeah. Like, I think the one I saw in the U.S. was, like, 14 billion small mammals and birds. They, they go out and they hunt, and we have taken some of the most successful and specialized hunters 
in mammal history and carried them to every habitat on the planet and let them loose. Which is like, is bad here in North America, but we also already have like bobcats yes. here that are doing, so the animals here have had cats. Right. They're a little more prepped for it. They're not prepped for this numbers number of cats. But then you have like Australia. Yeah. Which is, the feral cats there are not just dangerous to the wildlife, they're dangerous to people now. Yeah. <laughs> like, people have been mauled <laughs> by these feral domesticated cats. It, they're monsters. Yeah. They are. So, it they have become, like, this incredible evolutionary success story and ecological natural disaster. disaster. <laughs> <laughs> so, pl please keep that in mind uh, with your own pet cats. We are indeed Pro indoor cats. Please keep your cats indoors. Yes. Keep your keep your cats indoors and don't declaw them. Yes. Those are the those are the two the two big rules. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you declaw, you're taking the tip of their finger off, and that's horrifying. Well, yeah, I mentioned those that it's the two last bones in the toe. Well, declawing generally is the removal of that last bone. Declawing is not taking your fingernail off. It's taking the tip of your finger with the fingernail on it. Yeah, from off. the knuckle. Yeah, from that down to that the tip. joint. Off. That's gross. And thus ends the story of cats, for now, <laughs> from their small uh, uh, hypercarnivorous beginnings to their small hypercarnivorous nows. <laughs> they are a fascinating group of animals. They are one of my favorite groups of mammals, because they're basically mammalian dromaeosaurs. Yes. The, 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 I, or at the very least, I like to think that dromaeosaurs were very cat-like, and thus that allows me to say that cats are... <laughs> mammalian <laughs> raptor dinosaurs I, the, it's got a lot of the it's you're you got hooks and knives on you and your retractable claws yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. also knife slinkies <laughs> i is it is it a surprise <laughs> that i'm a big fan of the flexible knifey yeah yeah mammals so cats has been a, a, a wonderful journey through cats next episode we will look at their kind of counterparts Dogs. Dogs. But hey, before we leave, uh, we have a patron question. Oh boy! Hey, one of the things that our patrons get to do at a certain level is ask us questions to answer on the podcast, and we happen to have one here to wrap up the episode. Will, would you like to read our patron question? Absolutely. Uh, this question is from our patron Serpentine, cool name. Yep. I like it. Who has described that they've been feeling bad about the trouble they've been having with Fossil prep. Ah. Uh, yeah, and, volunteering at a, at a local museum, if I remember correctly. And has been having some issues, uh, or, or issues they've noticed. And they said, to help them feel better, if you're willing, could you please share the biggest fossil prep stuff up you've done or seen, or failing that's particularly egregious from history? Yeah. So, fun question. That's a, that's a fun one. Uh, before we, we talk about, like, egregious examples or anything, I do want to make the note, uh, Will and I have both done prep work. Yes, you more than me. On fossil, you know, cleaning fossils, uh, uh, preparing fossils for research and storage. It's not easy. No. And I have definitely left, like, scratches on fossils uh, when I was learning how to do prep. Um, I have definitely broken fossils while handling them, which, fortunately... If you're in a prep lab, you can fix it. Yes, you're in the right spot. You're in the right spot. But no, it it is it takes some getting used to. Uh, at the Gray Fossil site, our preparator Sean will teach new preparators with the less exciting uh, bone fragments, because just in case you're scratching it up, it's you're not doing it on like a one of a kind specimen. Yeah. You're doing it on like taper femur number. 77 exactly. or whatever yeah you're doing on the 50th toe bone that we've found so don't try to break it but <laughs> we will survive yeah and don't and don't feel bad about taking the time to get to know a thing well, uh, this is a this is a major skill so and like any major skill it takes time and practice and patience it is not it's not something where you can describe how to do it and then immediately be doing it correctly because it is complicated uh in in our lab and in many labs there are specific rules for what to do if you drop a fossil yes because it's gonna happen mm -hmm. uh there are specific procedures where like hey if you break a fossil while transporting it yeah those things happen i have done 
all of those things. I have broken fossils. I have dropped fossils on the floor. Uh, it has it has happened. Yeah, my my worst one. I, most of the stuff I did in lab was picking at the microscope. So tweezers, teeny tiny fossils, picking it out of sediment and chunks of wood that we can't fossil wood that we can't really use. And every now and then you'd go to pick up one, and the edge of your tweezer would hit the dish, the little petri dish first. And then when you go to close it, they were flexi tweezers, so you could not crush the fossil. They were, right. you know, bendy. But what it meant is if you were not careful, it would hit the dish, and then you'd go to close it, and it would bend ever so slightly until you closed it enough, and then it would just flick. Tween. And it would send the thing that was about the s less than half the size of a grain of rice. Just yep. you'd hear, pink. Well, that seed's gone. <laughs> and, it, and what you will often then do is say, okay, everybody, stop. Yep. And then you don't move your chair. You call someone over. Like, yes, because hey. we have wheelie office chairs in that lab. <laughs> yep. And you don't roll hard wheels across the ground <laughs> once you've dropped something you tiny say, and hey, fragile. I dropped a I dropped a seed. I dropped a snake vertebra. Come on over and find it. Yeah, someone has to come check around your chair while you sit in it. Now, there have, of course, been famous examples of things breaking in transit or old fossils that were prepped incorrectly. And reconstructed, like, embarrassingly wrong. Yeah, there ha there are cases of, like, you know, every now and then we'll have a new technology. Mm -hmm. Like, like recently you'll have stories of people going to museums and, like, trying these new lasers scanning on fossils and be like, hey, the sediment around these bones has all these cool chemical clues to their, like, skin and feathers and stuff. This is great. Where what other fossils have sediment around them? And they're like, we prepped that. Yeah. Like we we got rid of all the sediment because we didn't know you could do that. Yeah. So there are definitely like hindsight hindsight say. things. Um, if you want a particularly egregious example, I I do have a story <laughs> that a friend of mine told me once. So I will not use names or locations, but I will tell you. Uh, and I, I wasn't there. I don't know the people involved. But this was this is a recent story, so <laughs> but this is one that it, it, I've I I yeah recent like modern times. Yes, exactly. This is an uh, historical. This is one that always comes to mind. This was it's within the last several years uh, a fossil site in North America, where at one point in the the site's history a it came under the the operations of a group of people who were not necessarily particularly familiar with paleontological procedures yeah. of, of preparation fossil and such. Prep. And they excavated a large fossil, one of the uh, a piece of one of those impressive large ancient animals that you know we like to put on display. Yeah, it was places. like a, a big bone, not just like a big bone. Yeah, a big bone, which of course was dirty and not knowing how best to clean it. And not having, like, contacts to go to to get it to a facility that where it could be properly handled. Took it into town, drove it into town, and took it to the local car wash. Mm -hmm. And used a pressure washer to clean it such that when it eventually did end up in the hands of a museum with the materials to, to prep it properly, the museum folks received a bajillion pieces rubble of what used to be this big bone yeah that's the one that always comes to my mind as, as far as cringe inducing in, incorrect prep stories so don't pressure wash your fossils nope that's a bad that's a bad plan and yeah if you're not pressure washing your fossils you're doing better <laughs> you're not the worst it's not the, you're not the worst prep story yeah <laughs> Serpentine, that is a great, uh, that is a very good question. That is a fun one to answer. It's a very relatable question. Too. I hope that this, these answers have helped to assuage some of your uh, concerns. <laughs> Keep at it. Uh, it's good to have people out there prepping fossils. And I think it's time to wrap up the episode. I had a great, grand old time learning about cats, sharing information about cats, and I am excited for next episode to learn about dogs yeah so tune in then tune in then thanks to the people who requested this topic thanks to all of our patrons new and old thanks to all of you for listening like we said you can join us on patreon you can buy our merchandise on zazzle you can follow us on the social medias 
review us on iTunes, any way you want to show your appreciation and support, we will appreciate it and support it. Find links to all those on the blog where we will be posting links for this episode. Absolutely. We release episodes every fortnight. Let us know what else you want to hear about, and we'll see what we can do. This is one of the only time. I think this is the second time ever in the history of the podcast, maybe the third time, that at the end of an episode, we have already announced what the next episode is going to yes. be. Yes. Yeah. So come back next time for dogs. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.